I'm Emma G. Rose. I'm Shell Shearer. We're indie authors. And this is Indie Book Talk. Hello and welcome back to Indie Book Talk. Today we have an amazingly exciting guest. Amelia Loken is the author of Unravel. And Unravel is an awesome book because it features a deaf main character who happens to be a princess and happens to be a lot of other cool things, but she's deaf. And Amelia can write about these things with a lot of empathy, I think, because she is hard of hearing and is a former sign language interpreter. So I'm thrilled to talk to Amelia about writing characters with disabilities. And Amelia, welcome to the show. Yay, welcome. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. So for those that have followed us before, you might recognize her name because she was one of the brave souls who gave us a chapter to critique early on. Um, it was this wonderful steampunk um, story, and I'm still very sad that that's not the book we're going to talk about today because I really <laughs> want to read it. <laughs> it is not done yet. I'm working on it, but it's not yet publishable, but I'm having so much fun writing it. So it will definitely get out into the world as soon as I can get it out there. Great. So I was looking at your website and so I understand uh, why you're writing the deaf character, but it sounds like you write for a variety of disabilities. Uh, so I think in the other one we're reading, the lady was blind or definitely? She was low vision. So low something vision. that we would consider legally blind in um, that story, she does use a cane and she uses a brailer to type out um, her notes for herself. Um, but she is low vision where she has some vision, but it's blurry and she's not able to um, see things as crisply as many of us do. And, you know, many of us wear glasses, but even with, you know, without our glasses, we can kind of see what we're doing, but she's low vision. That's the classification that is used. Great. But in this one that we're going to talk about today, um, she's kind of a self-saving princess. She's, she's very yes, much her own woman. <laughs> yes. Now at the beginning, she's not so as self-saving as she becomes by the end of it. But yes, she is trying to do her best to um, take care of the most important things. And, uh, keep her priorities in and making sure that the innocent are taken care of. And if she can save herself at the same time, great. If not, she will make sure that others are taken care of first. I love her. Everything I've seen about her on Instagram, I'm like dying to read this book, but it literally just came out and it's not in my hands yet. <laughs> um. So what have you been reading on Instagram? Dem is far more better at Instagram than I am. And that was a horrible grammatical sentence. But she is. <laughs> she, well, she's been doing a lot of um, quotes from the book on Instagram and nice. some beautiful visuals. And so yeah. I really feel like I kind of know this character, even though I haven't read the book yet. Um, and granted, I'm biased because I had read that first chapter of the other story that we read and was super excited by it. So I immediately went and followed you and was waiting for the next thing. And got lucky because it hasn't been that long since we read that one. And now there's a book. Yay! I'm so glad that you are getting excited about Marguerite's story because I'm really excited to share with readers. I've had so much fun with her and Tice and the other characters in my head and this world that they inhabit. And I've just been chomping at the bit ready to share it with readers. I just want to be able to have conversations about them and see other people excited about their story as much as I am. So are you getting a lot of feedback from your Instagram posts? I'm starting to get a few things back. It's only been out a week. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I have had um, some family members and some friends who've gotten their books in their hands and they will, they'll te text message me or send me little things saying, oh, I'm at this point or they've gone to the island or I can't believe she did this or what's going to happen because like, I know she doesn't want to do this thing, but it looks like she's going to do this thing. I'm like, yep, keep reading. <laughs> Actually, one of the most fun things to do is, uh, is been watching my husband because he wanted to know what was going on in the story I'd been writing. And a couple of years ago, I started reading to him. And so we would read half a chapter or a full chapter a night before we go to bed. And then we got about to the halfway mark. And then I was like, Oh, no, like, I really need to change the plot here. Like, this isn't gonna work. And he's like, 
well, well, tell me what happens. I'm like, well, I can't tell you what's going to happen because I'm going to have to change what's already happened. So you're just going to have to wait. So I went through this huge revision and he's been waiting very, very patiently for me to tell him what happens. But I, you know, I was doing edits and I was doing this and that. And so finally, when we went to our local bookstore and I was able to sign some copies um, a week and a half ago, and he's like, I'm buying the first copy. And so he, <laughs> it. he had me personalize it and he bought it and he started reading while we were still in the bookstore. And, and I will come up to the bedroom and he'll be there on the bed and he'll be sprawled out and he's got my book in his hand and he's reading. And then I'll say, how's it going? He's like, oh my gosh, like, here's the thing that's happening. And I cannot believe this. And so do you think this is going to happen? I'm like, well, I guess <laughs> we'll have to see, but I'll find him at the table. I'll find him in the easy chair and he's got my book. So it's been so much fun watching him enjoy my story. So that's been great. You are too kind. I won't let my husband read anything. I write. <laughs> <laughs> I just love the supportiveness of a partner who wants to read your stuff that badly. That's wonderful. <laughs> it's been wonderful. Yeah. Let's talk a minute about Marguerite and why you chose to write a character who is deaf, because I imagine that makes some things very challenging in your story and not a lot of writers make that choice. So why did you? Well, I'll have to tell you, honestly, when I first wrote her, she was regular, she had regular hearing like uh, any other character in any other book. But as I was going through it um, a couple of years ago and looking at her, her personal um, character arc, there were some things that my critique group had talked to me about that she really needed to do to make sure that she was being more active. And as I was going through that and I was having my own experiencing uh, experience grappling with my own loss of hearing and realizing how much I was missing, I had a eureka moment. I thought, well, what if she's hard of hearing or what if she's deaf? What would that mean? And her having to learn how to still be strong and independent and have this identity where others would see her as weak. And at that same time, I was reading um, a book by Alison Alexander, who is a, an editor for a small press in Canada um, called Mythos and in Ink. And her book called Super Sick is about her own experience with chronic illness. And she talks about how we just don't see disabled or characters with chronic illness in books or when they are in books and they are representative, represented they're staying at the lair, you know, they'll be the computer expert, or they'll do this or do that. And she's like, why can't they go on an adventure? And I thought, okay, I have this girl going on an adventure, and she needs some more character or something in there. Let's see how this works. And it was interesting, as I went back and had to reverse engineer some things, there were huge chunks of dialogue I had to take out or I had to figure out how I could make it work. If she needs to hear this for part of the plot or the story, how would she, how would she know? And one of the things that has been very important in my training in learning um, how to become an interpreter uh, with sign language is understanding deaf history and how many people in the deaf community have had language deprivation where they don't have full access to what's going on around them because either the people around them in their family or in their community don't know sign language or um, they're expected to do lip reading or other means of, of communication that isn't as easy or accessible for them. And so that's been very frustrating. And sometimes in, in the past, um, there in many of the deaf schools uh, during the uh, 1800s, 1900s, students who were deaf who tried to use sign language were forced not to. And sometimes their hands were tied or, uh, you know, lights would be out in their dorm room. They couldn't, couldn't do any sign language on their own time. So that kind of understanding about how many people that are deaf um, have experienced that kind of um, discrimination and uh, language deprivation I thought would be that would be something that we could bring in and maybe generate some conversations later. Um, so I tried to make sure I was super respectful and make sure I didn't trot on an area that was not 
my area to talk about, but be able to bring in some things that I knew from my deaf culture classes that I had taken um, at the university and from other people I know in the deaf community who are friends and colleagues of mine. And um, so I, and I got some uh, other people to look at my uh, manuscript to make sure I was taking care of things the right way <laughs> and um, was representative in the way I, I needed to be. So that, that was, it was a process. So what kind of things did you get feedback on for that at all that they thought you might need to change or? In general, it was mostly, there. it was mostly good because I had had that university background in the training, but there were sometimes in ways that I presented situations that are like, I don't think she would be able to know what was going on here. Or um, sometimes in the sign language, I had it more ASL, American Sign Language, where in the story, I'm just presenting the communication that's happening as a sign language, because there's many sign languages around the world. So I wanted to be sure that I didn't have an actual ASL sign in there, but that I could do something that was generally understandable. So whether you're in Australia using Auslan sign language, or if you're in Germany or wherever, the sign language, it doesn't matter what the specifics are. It matters that there's hands are being used. So in, in cases where like you'd read in a regular novel where it says, he said, she said, I have parts where there's signing going on. He signed or she signed or his hands were moving. And I talk about his expression and, or like an eyebrow twitch that has to do with something to give an extra meaning because in sign language, it's not just what's on the hands. It's what's in, you know, your eyebrows and your face and your mouth, the non-manual parts of the vocabulary and parts of the, the meaning uh, that's going into the grammar there. That is challenging. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot to think about. And there were parts where in the dialogue, I knew that, the, you know, if, if someone's turning away, I oftentimes can't understand what they're saying. So I have parts where someone turns away and you have a sentence with an ellipse, you know, dot, dot, dot. What's the rest of it? Well, she doesn't know, the reader can't know because it's first person point of view. Okay. And then there's other points where she is watching and she's trying to understand, but she's catching a part of a phrase and then there's some ellipses and then more phrase and then some ellipses and then another phrase and ellipses. And she's trying to figure out how they all go together. And sometimes I had to drop some important information or sometimes I kept important information in there and I dropped you know, the articles like the ands, the thes and things. And so because when I'm dealing in situations where I don't understand and, uh, everything that's being said, I'm watching facial expression, I'm watching lip movement, I'm watching the head nodding or shaking, and I'm filling in gaps of what's being said. And I didn't realize how much I was filling in gaps until actually this January, I've been going back to school to get my master's degree in public administration um, for my regular day job. And the, for two semesters that I was doing it during the pandemic, we've had Zoom classes and I could adjust my headphones and the volume and I could see everyone's faces. And so I was getting a lot of information that way. But this semester, we're all in person and everyone's wearing masks. Oh, and man. I was missing so much information. So in the first week of class, I drove home and I was so exhausted. And I was so, the, the cognitive load of trying to fill in those gaps, especially with a lot of information that was new or with vocabulary that was new, because they're both new classes of, with topics that I wasn't familiar with, because you're in grad school, you're supposed to learn stuff you don't know. So I would be listening and watching and trying to figure out what was going on. And there was so much I was missing. And these classes, both of them were collaborative. So the professor's not doing a lecture, he's asking for input. So someone would say something, I had to turn around. And someone would be talking, but because of mass, I couldn't see who was talking. Finally, when I figured out from body movement, who was saying something, it would be moving on to the next person. And so I was trying to figure out, it was like a puzzle, but you don't have the picture on the box and just, you know, trying to stick all those pieces together. So I went to the Disability Resource Center. It, it was kind of humbling. It, it was definitely a new step for me. And I said, I can't understand everything in class enough that I need some kind of help. And we talked about getting a transcription service, but the microphone would be on the professor, not on anyone else in class. And then it would be going to a remote transcriptionist and then bounce back to class. And so I would be missing stuff. And so they said, well, you do know sign language. We could have two interpreters in there. And that's what I ended up doing. And 
there was a lot of feelings because I still have a lot of internalized ableism, even though I've had years of training with this, for me to be in the seat of the disabled person, you know, quote unquote, and watching the interpreters when I used to be the helper, when I used to be the bridge, and now I'm the one needing help and I need access and I need accommodation. That was really something that my brain had to wrestle with and my emotions had to wrestle with. And I think I'm still working through it, even though after that first class, when I was driving home, I was laughing. I was singing in the car (laughs) after that first night in class, having my interpreters there. There were people I knew, people that were colleagues of mine a couple of years ago. And now they were serving me. And, um, and I, I had, a, I, will, I still have some complex feelings about that. But being able to understand everything that was going on in class was amazing. So that was really helpful for me. So that's a very long answer <laughs> to your short question. But I tried to make sure that we had those gaps in there so that um, we could see how much Marguerite has to fill in in order to understand what's going on and be able to take control of her life and her destiny. Now, does Marguerite have any help? Does she have an interpreter or other supportive people who can help her to understand? That's a really good question. So at the very beginning of the story, she does. She has some magical hearing aids <laughs> that are through some magical hair combs, silver hair combs she wears in her head. And I, and I had so much fun with these. I modeled them after um, bone conduction hearing aids that are something that are used in the world. Um, not as often as the over the ear ones that you see most people wear, but it goes through the bone. And so uh, uh, having these hair combs up against her scalp would help bring that um, sound through, but they don't work super well. And um, so at about the 25% mark, she's able to meet some people who have sign language as a natural part of their life. And she finds out that this is a language that's been available to her, but has been kept from her. And so as she learns sign language with uh, this community that uses sign language as much as speaking, there's other people who learn it as well. And so in some other places throughout the book, in some locations, she has access to other people who sign. And sometimes it's her roommate. Sometimes it's her friend. Sometimes it's just in the school that she's at. And there are other times when she doesn't have anything. There are times when her hearing aids what work as hearing aids are taken from her. And there are times when she's got some access, sometimes it's poor access, and sometimes there's no access. And so we get to see how Marguerite deals with those varying levels of accessibility and how frustrating that is and how she rises to the challenge. I am so excited about this book. (laughs) (laughs) Once we get this book, are Mm -hmm. we anticipating a book two? Or is there a series? What have we got here? I have a book to outline, but at this point, I don't have a contract on it. Press that I'm with is a small press. And so it's in my contract that it's very possible to do a book too. We, but we kind of were holding off until this baby got born. And now that the baby is born, we're going to talk about that some more. And I, I'm really hoping that the readers will let me know how much they like it so that I can have a little something in my back pocket when I go to the publishers and say, you know... Readers would really like to know more about what happens in this story, because what I would love to do is have some of the secondary characters. What I have planned out is some of the secondary characters have their own stories and build on Marguerite's story until it comes to a natural conclusion. But I can't say any more than that. (laughs) Fine. But you mentioned on your website that this book took years because you were honing it and perfecting it. We're going to have like more of an eight month book for book two. or (laughs) That's a good question. So I have an outline already done. I have um, a bunch of it already in chunks. So it would be a much faster process. And really a lot of the process that went into book one was I think, I was still learning the craft. I think that was a lot of it. I was still learning. I had great a great critique group. I went to writing conferences. I was learning some good stuff that they have available online, et cetera. You know, there's a lot of resources out there. Um, but I would, you know, have my work critiqued and I'd get it back. And I, I was still learning. I feel like I've got a much better grasp of what I need to do. And I'm noticing in other books that I'm writing now, 
that my process is a lot quicker. Um, so I think that it would it would definitely happen at, at a much faster rate than than the original did. And I think I also needed to figure out um, how how I'm going to do that with managing my other responsibilities. When I was writing Unravel, I was literally a full time student, and all of my children were in elementary school and middle school at the time. So. I was juggling a lot, you know, (laughs) and now my kids are older and they're a lot more self-sufficient and I am doing grad school, but I'm getting close to the end. So I'm hoping that in a year or two, I'll have a a lot less on my plate and I can focus a lot more on the writing that I'm longing to do. So tell us if people want to keep track of your next book or, you know, tell you what's amazing about this book and how they cannot wait for the sequel, where can they find you online? They can find me with the handle at Amelia Loken, and that's A-M-E-L-I-A-L-O-K-E-N. And that's on Instagram, on Twitter, and on TikTok. I'm trying out the whole TikTok thing now, having fun with it. Um, I'm also on Facebook, but I mostly have friends that I know or people that I'm acquainted with um, that are much closer to me. So readers and um, strangers that want to become readers, like absolutely get in touch with me, but stick with um, Instagram, Twitter, or TikTok. That's where I would love to have direct messages or other comments on my posts. That would be fantastic. And I've got a lot of fun content out there too. I think you'll enjoy it. And you do um, sign language posts, right? Yes, I do sign language videos um, on Instagram and some on TikTok. TikTok. And they're a lot of fun. I haven't had a lot of feedback about them. So if you like them, let me know on social media so I can do more of them. Okay, so I hope my book comes tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't come today. I hope so too. I hope so too.